So good morning and welcome for everybody coming here. And I have a feeling that's really loud. Yeah, <laughs> it's early. Um, my name's Carol Barrett. I'm with Intel Corporation. Um, um, and I've also been doing work here in the community around uh, an, a, a group called Win the Enterprise, which is bringing together a, a group of folks who are focused on driving OpenStack to be successful in the enterprise IT marketplaces and coming together to understand what we need to do uh, in multiple ways around OpenStack to go ahead and be successful. Um, and today, I wanted to talk with everybody about where we started and where we've come to and uh, where we want to go to. And I'm looking to go ahead and uh, bring new members into the teams that we've formed for the last uh, couple of months so that we can go ahead and achieve the goals that we want to set forth for uh, between now and taking us to Kilo. So, um, and I... So what we've done is really focused on identifying what are the barriers for enterprise IT to deploy OpenStack today. Not what they need six months from now, not what they need a year from now, but what is standing in their way of being able to deploy it today. And we found that sometimes those barriers are around technical features and capabilities that we can go ahead and address in a short term um, through a series of different approaches. Sometimes it's around documentation and how-to guides. Sometimes it's about awareness and perception. They're not aware of OpenStack or they have views on how capable and complete OpenStack is and how ready it is for enterprise deployment. And sometimes it's about being able to see case studies and other reference architectures to see how other people who are similar to them have deployed OpenStack today and what value they've gotten out of it so that they can build their plans around it and their business justifications to deploy it. The group actually came together um, in Atlanta. So six months ago, we had our first bird of a feather session. Um, and we brought together a, uh, a group at that time, and then additional folks joined us over the course of these last six months. And we initially kicked off five teams. We identified that the barriers segmented themselves. So we kicked off an application availability team, um, a manageability team, service availability, which was referring to the OpenStack services, security and compliance, and a marketing and a business team. So we went ahead and brought together about um, 70 people from 25 different companies across these teams. And these teams operated to go ahead and identify what were the key barriers, look at how they would prioritize the ones, because there were pretty long lists in each of these areas as to what the issue were. Um, created a ZBB line, identified what were the top three that we actually thought we could do something about in a six month period of time. Um, and uh, took that list to the OpenStack board meeting in July, which was in Portland, Oregon, in conjunction with OzCon that was going on at that time, and showed them what we had um, identified and what our plans were to take action on them. They told us to go ahead and move forward. And so coming out of that, we identified that there were some common um, barriers that went across application manageability, service availability, and security compliance. And they were around OpenStack deployment and upgrade, um, monitoring, and then cattle and pets. How do you go ahead and onboard existing IT enterprise workloads into a cloud? So we formed three additional teams coming out of July. And since then, the teams developed action plans and have been executing to them. What they've... Um, what it looked like was that we ended up with over 75 participants, and there were a lot of individuals who were in multiple teams because folks have interests that span multiple areas, and they have development teams that span multiple projects and multiple areas. Um, it was over 25 companies that came together. We've had a series of folks who have joined us even in the last couple of weeks, folks from Oracle and Stratus, Liberty Mutual Insurance, EMC, and I'm hoping to build with that list here today. Um, and we've got eight work groups that are actively working today. And over the last six months, we've got over 1,200 of collaboration hours across all of these folks working to execute on what we identified as the problems and the actions to fix. 
And what those fix look like was, in the case of the marketing team and the business team, we did some content development to provide the support of messaging and being able to show proof points around uh, OpenStack deployments and people getting value out of OpenStack for their business. We updated documentation that filled some of the gaps and aligned the documentation with the current capabilities in OpenStack, specifically around federated ident identification. We went to the San Antonio Operators Summit in August and met with a series of OpenStack operators to understand what their real barriers were around monitoring and deployment and onboarding existing IT workloads into the cloud because we needed more requirements and details of what was stopping them from being able to move forward so we could understand what we needed to do to get rid of those barriers for them. They gave us good information. And so from there, we went ahead and developed a series of blueprints and, and proposals that are actively being worked through the design summits that are going on. And what you see is um, by the different teams, what the titles of the blueprints are, what projects they're in, links. And I'll go ahead and uh, post the slides up uh, on a Google Doc. And there's an ether pad that you can find in the schedule notice. And I'll put a link to the Google Docs file in there as well. Um, and feel free to go ahead and um, you know go to the Etherpad and put any type of questions. I'm looking at it and I'll log into it as well. And then you can see the folks who are going ahead and driving um, those different blueprints and conversations. Today we have actually the monitoring Cinder conversation is going to happen later on this afternoon, and tomorrow we'll have the Capacity Headroom Nova conversation happening. I'm not sure what the timeline on all the other ones are off the top of my head. So we really tried to get focused on again. What are the barriers today? And what can we actually take action on and solve in a short period of time? And either by making the modifications and driving uh, enhancements to OpenStack, uh, some cases it's working with ecosystem partners because it's through that combination of OpenStack and an ecosystem um, partner solution that we can actually create a whole solution that can be deployed but really looking to um, make impact now, not in the future. And so today, what I um, would like to do is, really a goal is to bring more community members into the work groups. There's a lot of desire to continue to push through to the L um, release, and that um, what we're trying to figure out is, What's that next set of barriers that we're going to go after? Right? What are you seeing, hearing from your customers or your partners that are preventing people from deploying OpenStack today? Um, who in your organizations can work with us to go ahead and um, understand those barriers, define the solutions to them, bring resources to developing those solutions, and driving it into the design summits and then out into the marketplace. Um, and around that is, do we have the right teams in the right focus areas? Do we need more? Do we need to redefine how these teams are operating or what they're specifically looking at? And how would you want to go ahead and define success around the needs that you know of and the things that you would want to see happen for your businesses between now and Kilo? So there's a, as I said, an ether pad that we've got open. So if you um, have comments, questions, or want to go ahead and uh, put your name and, and email address so we can go ahead and link up, that would be a great way to go ahead and get connected. There is a mail list, a mail group, that's also um, set up through the OpenStack um, community list, and it's um, Enterprise WG. Um, and then sort of two other things before I go ahead and open up for conversation is um, tomorrow there's two follow-on conversations that I wanted to share with everybody. There's going to be a longer, deeper working meeting around Win the Enterprise where we'll probably do some work in the specific teams and talk about very detailed uh, barriers to try and come out of here with a, um, a start of a focus for the next six months for us. And then there's a telco working group 
that's coming together tomorrow morning, which is going to include both um, telco cloud operators as well as the um, NFV sub-team that's been operating within OpenStack today to go ahead and look at how do you work to address telco barriers today. So th generally, th maybe some things around scale and performance um, so that they can go ahead and expand their OpenStack deployments and then continue to work into the future as they migrate from where they are today in SDN into NFV. And so looking at that from being a development operators and business and marketing type of a focus as well. So I wanted to share that in case you all have interest in multiple segments, which I hear from lots of people that they do. So I'd like to, um, I'd love to have some conversation and hear your uh, thoughts and what you hear from your customers and partners around barriers for them, right? The enterprise customers to be able to go ahead and deploy OpenStack today. Hi. Yeah. Okay. And on the uh, the maturity, are there features that come around that? You know, how do they? What are the examples they'll use that telling you that? It's right. Sure, I'm sorry. So he was saying that what um, they're hearing is that people are, the customers are talking about a couple things. So that OpenStack uh, is lacking maturity, stability, and upgradability, um, and that uh, they need a longer term roadmap to be able to go ahead and understand where the product's going. So today we'll publish something around a six month roadmap. They'd really like to see an 18 month roadmap. Um, and that when they talk about stability, they're really talking about things like live migration, right? Needing those capabilities and needing those to be robust. Yeah. So uh, one of the things we just recently ran into in the Ice House release is we upgraded in Keystone from a stable Ice House release to, uh, I think it was dot two, and a change got put in that totally broke AD integration. It's a uh, a thing to deal with like UTF-8 uh, characters and I couldn't find a bug that that got tied back to so it seems like we get a stable release which should be I guess feature frozen from a standpoint mm -hmm. but there's still features getting ported back into it which I can understand if it's solving a bug or something like that but mm -hmm. there's I mean if we're dealing with if some of us are used to the Red Hat thing where it's like it's frozen and there'll be some stuff backported, but it's like API compatible, it you end up with a, right. I'm on a stable branch, everything's working, I upgrade the version and now it's totally busted and there's no bug or anything that's related to it. It's it's kind of hard to, I don't see a, a bear or a line that says what gets backported and what doesn't in terms of getting backported into versions from from trunk. Was it the API that changed and that's what broke or was it some internal function? It's internal code. So okay. it was basically anything that goes through a LDAP query, there wasn't an appropriate function. So in Active Directory, if you had a picture, it tried to do a UTF-8 conversion on binary data and that just totally broke every function related to it. So like, Keystone refused to work with Active Directory.
Yeah, there is later on. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a desire to actually get that to be much longer than that. Yeah. Okay. So Thank you. Oh. Hi, uh, I'm Ron Kaufman, Morantis. Hi. So um, <laughs> until last week, I was with Oracle, so <laughs> it's changed for me. But so one thing that uh, we do see when we go to enterprise customers is, you know, the first thing they want is a two to three year support, no question asked. That's what they want. Their test cycle is probably more than six months. Anyways, and I think the community is, by definition right now, is dropping the, the release that was released like six months ago. There's no vulnerability uh, management. Actually, the foundation will deny you of the name OpenStack if you're not supporting one of the two latest releases. So it's not like you can say, okay, I'm staying on Ice House for three years, don't leave me alone, because the rules and the whole mindset is around you got to move fast which works great for development and we don't want to stop that but we do want to make sure that customers could remain on, on a version supported for two three years and maybe uh, that's something for you know the textbook answer is like yeah your distribution go do it well first of all the foundation won't let me uh, right now technically I think that's an easy easy one to solve but I think even bigger problem is that we encourage as community people to move forward to the next release and that's uh, something that um, is, is difficult for, for the customers. It's difficult for the partners who are developing plugins and have to update them every six months. And it's, uh, you know, there is only so much you can do on Garrett and uh, a checking process to checks for scale, for example. You can't check things in a hundred node scale. Mm -hmm. And those will break. And so I think there, there are two avenues this could work out. One, each distribution will do its own thing. You know, Red Hat uh, said that ISAS will be supported for three years. Cool. And then uh, uh, Juno comes along. Now Juno is going to be supported for three years. And Kiel comes along. Now Kiel is going to be supported for three years. All of a sudden, Red Hat needs to support five different versions for three years mm -hmm. at, at any given time. So I think five, six. Exactly. So, so my, my point is this. I want to make a point here. And uh, maybe, and that's a suggestion, uh, everybody's welcome to comment, is the community, as a community, needs to think about uh, a release which will become the long-term release and long-term support release. And then, you know, we continue every six months to deliver. We don't want to stop the innovation, but customer wants to uh, stabilize or a partner wants to write a plugin, writes it to that long-term supported release. And then, you know, if Red Hat wants to backport something, Mirantis wants to backport something, fine. But we are responsible for maintaining those APIs, those interfaces. And, and, and I think for a lot of enterprise customers, this will be a very useful uh, way to, to do things. That might do sense, so. What do other people think about that? Please. Yeah, I was expecting somebody from Canonical to kind of jump. Okay.
Just, I have a little comment about that. You know, y the train moves on. Always there are new features. But at some point, you got to say, okay, here is a good baseline. And then, you know, the distributions could differentiate by adding more features if they want to, but as long as they keep things stable. So that question that you raise is like, uh, is Juno good enough? Well, is Kilo good enough? Is the L you know, good enough. It will never be good enough, but you have to say if we want to get serious about onboarding enterprise customers, you got to say here is something I'm starting with. And, uh, you know, you may correct in two years, but uh, you don't want to start that only in the, you know, four releases from now because, um, you know, every enterprise customer in, you know, my former life, I was dealing with these guys a lot, and they're just, it's a non starter. You know, six months, major release, major upgrade, forget it. It's just not something that they will even start. And I think from an OpenStack point of view, there's the desire to keep everybody close to the trunk. Right? And so how do you balance that between well, having long-term support and stability and trying to keep people close to the trunk? Yeah. I think it's a... Yeah, that's a so excellent question. That is it definitely not something... I think it's more of a develop it's a like. community developer viewpoint, I think, much more so than the customers that we're trying to serve. But I would imagine that um, it could be that the customer challenge becomes fragmentation. Right? And so some of the value propositions around OpenStack and the ability for enterprise customers to choose across different distributions depending upon what their needs are that value proposition could erode over time if we see a lot of fragmentation in the distributions that go out because everybody gets away from trunk. I mean, maybe those are the, the two sides of that. Yeah. So uh, Bill, Bill Franklin, HP. Um, so I'll, I'll partially agree and partially disagree with one or two of the comments that have been made so far. Um, there are a lot of enterprises that are actually actively doing work with OpenStack. Um, they've deployed it. We've seen, I mean, you know, uh, Raj Rajiv Khanna was speaking from Expedia the other day. Uh, the Comcast guys mm -hmm. were talking in Hong Kong. There are a lot of companies that have deployed this. Often it's in a proof of concept environment or it's in a greenfield development environment. But there are enterprises using it. And for you know, are there, are there any enterprise customers in this room, or are all we all mostly vendors? Enterprise, okay. great. Who are enterprise? We got, we got a couple of them in here. So I spend about half of my time talking to a lot of HP's enterprise customers. So I would encourage the enterprise customers that are in this room to tell the OpenStack community, particularly if you've currently deployed OpenStack the things that you want to see us change to make it easier to consume, mm -hmm. um, and more importantly, make it easier to take it from a proof of concept right. or a smaller project to the standard. We're really at the point where the client-server revolution is starting to change, and it's shifting in corporate, global corporates to a cloud-based infrastructure. So my, my first point would be, yes, I think there are enterprises using it, and you know they're having trouble cutting their teeth on it. It's the same way, I'm an older guy, it's the same way Unix started in you know between 85 and, or between about 82 and 85 or 87. So that would be comment one. And then comment two is there is a, a tension within a lot of the enterprise community that I talk to around how close they want to stay to Trump. And, it, and it's really, if you look back in history, it's the same thing that existed with some of the very large early Unix distributions and then Linux ones. It's this David Comey sitting here who used to be a, a chief architect um, at Sun, and it was a whole investigation of the, you know, the arc of change that you want in, the, in user land, in Unix and in Linux. And I think if you talk to developers in the enterprise, they want to stay close to trunk, if you talk to the infrastructure people that deploy infrastructure as a service and the cloud, they want to have as much stability as possible. So it's that tension within the enterprise and ways that we can solve that for the enterprise so that the infrastructure components maybe don't change as fast, but the parts that some of the developers are really interested in have an, ab an ability to change at a slightly different velocity. 
that's a hard technical problem to solve, but often, if we go back and look at what we all did in the client-server world, that was the place where we met that gap. And we allowed the change to occur up in user land and the infrastructure stayed a lot more stable. Hmm. So maybe yeah. we want to think about that. I don't know. Sure. Not, ne not necessarily, you know, if I was queen for a day, I wouldn't necessarily look at it in terms of separating it out from dev to prod because you really want to be able to have a, a constant, constant um, progression and look at some degree of continuous integration. It's an aspect of what do you, what do you want to update and what do, you, what do you don't? And if we could have a way of saying lock down this, don't allow this to change, but allow yeah. this to change up here, and even better yet, have an understanding of the dependency graph of if I change this up here, what are all the other packages that need to be modified to make it work? That would allow an enterprise to maybe say, for compliance reasons, these things can't change. We've certified them for our own specific compliance requirements, but these things over here can change. And we don't really give them that capability yet. We, do, we have in the client server world, but we haven't quite gotten there yet with OpenStack. So just a thought of ways of thinking about this. Yeah. Other comments or thoughts on, on Bill's point or, or other? Go ahead, yeah. Well, as one of the few enterprise <laughs> customers here. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for coming to, <laughs> to visit with us. Uh, so I haven't really thought this out, but uh, I've been asked to put OpenStack into proof of concept in my enterprise so I can tell you what my problems were Okay. Uh, to begin with uh, installation uh, because we had to make a lot of choices and <laughs> seriously, m most of the choices seemed simple, right? But I had to make them at every single point of installation. So was I using Rabbit? Was I using uh, Zero MQ or Cupid or uh, whatever? Uh, so basically I had to roll my own passwords and everything going through the docs that were changing. But I already told <laughs> Ms. Gentle about that. Uh, s and so that that's one thing. Uh, basically I would have liked to install a, a package, right? Because I was going from the Red Hat, uh, the Red Hat packages. Uh, I would have liked to install a package with a controller and a package with a dashboard and uh, just configure the dashboard with one database or one controller. Uh, so maybe maybe it should work. Uh, I don't I don't think it does, but. Uh, just, I, I was configuring Nova config files at one point and the Notion config files at one point. Could there be um, a common configuration? So that basically installing a module, whether it's uh, Nova or Notron or, uh, or Compute or whatever, just point it to one IP with uh, one password and uh, it gets its configuration from there. That would be one thing. Uh, the other thing which I haven't really looked at is monitoring uh, because uh, we're a small team and uh, if we're going to use OpenStack it has to be 24 hours and uh, the guys who are working at 4 o'clock in the morning uh, they are not going to follow anything OpenStack. Uh, they want a red light to come on and uh, we do that with uh, nodules and truck and things like that. and. Uh, when the red light comes on, they click on the instructions and uh, do they have to relaunch something? Do they have to uh, call someone or, or whatever? Uh, heat by default, maybe. Uh, so that's, you, uh, you, do, you don't configure. When you install, uh, it should be by default, he is running and is saying that these services has have to be up. And uh, that would be that would be very much, uh, very much simpler. Gotcha. Okay. So just a really basic configuration that I'll install to that you can work off of and, and commonality between the components so you don't have to do each one of them exactly. the same. Exactly. Yeah. And mo most of the choices that I, I was supposed to make seemed simple to me. Uh, I mean, 
when installing OpenStack at a proof of concept, I didn't care about uh, Cupid or Rabbit or whatever. Uh, if I just pushed a button and uh, given an admin password, uh, my ideal would have been to uh, put in a put in a DNS name of my controller, and uh, when I'm finished, I can point to, to the HTTP port of that server and uh, put in the admin password, and I would have an OpenStack running, and that would be perfect. Yeah. And then I install. Uh, then when I install a, um, a Swift or Cinder, or uh, when I install a data storage module, it should only ask me what are the disks I can use, and uh, then it should present those. Okay. Gotcha. So we need to make it, we need to be able to make it consistent across releases. And then within a release, we need to have some commonality or consistency across the, co the services. <coughs> okay, so some way of being able to have, here's your core, here's the next tier it, okay. That's good.
So you need more of them that actually talk about integrating the different ser OpenStack services in different ways f as you're trying to, what was the last part? Okay. Are they are the ones that you see today? Are they not focused enough or clear enough on the use case that they're trying to solve that you can really re map them? Okay. Okay. There are some up. There are some up on the website. Yeah, we should talk about that. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, um, so we are out of time. Uh, but Ruchi, I always have time for you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, this is not working. So, but I'll speak just uh, loudly. I think what you pointed out and what we heard with another working session yesterday is we probably need to have a team as part work group uh, within your uh, and within the enterprise uh, initiative about around operating model and mm. of, you know the pain points around that because it's not about what should go inside open source but how do we use the tooling which should come out of there right and okay all righty so thank you all really appreciate the conversation and the thoughts and again we've got um more opportunities later on this week. So please come join us tomorrow afternoon and let's continue the dialogue. And I will go ahead and mine the etherpad between now and then as well. Thank you. <laughs>